Welcome to the Time Has Come podcast. My name is Graham Wardle, and today I have my good friend Engel Ferrisides on the show. Engel is the co-owner of Yoga Grace and Yoga Grace Online. He's also the founder of Pranayama Sadhana, the School of Pranic Studies. I'm grateful to be able to share our conversation with you all today. During this episode, Engel will demonstrate a short breath practice, so it's best to enjoy this episode with some headphones and at a time that you won't be disturbed. One of my favorite takeaways from this episode was how Engel speaks words of victory over others to empower them. And I just love that concept. We also cover finding community during tough times, appreciation, God, magical synchronicities, and we even talk about Sasquatch and mermaids. <laughs> so I hope you enjoy this episode. The time has come to welcome Engel Ferrisides to the podcast. Engel, how are you doing today? Doing really good. It's great to be here. Awesome, man. Well, thank you for being a part of this uh, experience. This is a really fun thing for me to do these podcasts. And I really wanted to have you on because I got so much from your breathwork sessions at your yoga studio, Yoga Grace. And it was about a year ago that I first went in there, wasn't it? Yeah, right when COVID was yeah, It was happening. just when COVID happened, yeah. And I walked in and I was like, hey, and you were sitting at the front there. And I sat down and I was like, this place is special. There's not fear here. And it was, that was when the fear was really starting to ramp up. And I remember feeling really uneasy inside. I was like, this is really, it was, it felt like I was suffocating. And I came into your studio and we did a breathwork session and I felt so grateful that there was, I'd found a place. I'd found some people that were still connecting. They were still in their heart and there was, there was a love there and it was, it was great, dude. So I'm very happy to have you on the podcast. Breathwork is something that I don't know how many of the listeners out there have ever done it before, but I wanted to share with everybody the benefits of it because for me, it's this journey into a space, into an altered state of consciousness where you can really see things about yourself, similar to meditation, but there is this beautiful unfolding that you are participating with in these, uh, what do you call them, like routines of breath or? A practice. I practice guess. of breath, yeah. And we'll get to a little uh, practice. So you're going to lead everybody through a little uh, taste of breathwork. But first, tell me why you got involved with breathwork and what does it mean to you to facilitate breathwork? Mm, firstly, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. And uh, I'm grateful to be a part of this experience with you. Breathwork is powerful. Mm -hmm. it has a, as you've experienced, it has the opportunity to really change our life. Um, in that moment when you came to the studio and we'd met, my wife, I think, was corresponding with you on the online, and she, oh yeah, yeah, you yeah. had said, you know, I, I just, I love that you're doing it online, but I'm, I just want to see people. I want to, I want to be around. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I get it, and I, uh, you know, I think everybody can get that now at this point. It's so important to be around people, mm -hmm. and breathing, breath work is a process of using our breathing to come to a place of deeper clarity. So breathwork has been used throughout antiquity. All cultures have used it, even the Christian tradition. All of them use different forms of breathing to come to more of a place of calm. Mm. And there are variables to that, varieties of that. It can be a quick, intentional breath as you come into your prayer. It can be like a five-minute breathing practice of just calmly following your breath. Or it can be a little more intense where you start to dedicate maybe 15, 20, 30 minutes mm -hmm. like you experienced three yeah, yeah, hours. Yeah. yeah, three hours is a lot. It's, it's very, that's, that's the, you don't go more than three hour sessions, do you? You can. I mean, I, I'm thinking of maybe pushing it for Guinness World Records. <laughs> for real? <laughs> That'd be cool. Why not? <laughs> so what is it that got you involved? What got you passionate about breathwork? Why did you get involved with it? I think the best answer to that is is like a snowball effect. Like a snowball rolls down the hill and is picking up more snow as it goes down the hill. There was a few things that were happening in my life that were leading me to that. I was always interested in personal development. I was always interested in becoming a better person. Philosophy was um, kind of the center point of my life since a young kid. Always asking questions. Mm -hmm. Always, always. And the questions were a little deeper than usual. Parents would have trouble entertaining them. <laughs> Like what's the meaning of life and kind of stuff like yeah, that? What's the meaning of life? And then, you know, building a birdhouse with my grandpa and asking more questions than were necessary. And the questions were 
like based on design principles, you know, ah, okay. and, and aspects of location and what would best serve the location, you know, just random. Yeah. 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 But more thoughtful stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so my life was really based around that. And as everybody, I put a mask on at, at some point, you know, to change. And then that aspect of me kind of became suffocated and just stayed there. Like, a psychological mask we're talking, not yeah, a face mask. Like yeah, a, like a psychological mask <laughs> yeah. uh, to fit in, you know, and to be a part of, because I never was a big person. Usually the people who fit in most are like the alpha characters in mm-hmm. environments. So like bigger, more dominant, stronger. I was really good at sports and all that stuff, but I was a young boy, small stature. And so I found martial arts at a young age, kung fu, all that type of stuff. It led to kickboxing. Kickboxing led to me being interested in striking. I really like that. So I started to realize that when I started getting anxious, my breath was out of control, but Mm. it was not like a, there wasn't a really deep sense of awareness there. Uh, Fast forward to kickboxing. I started to notice that when my breath was more controlled, my striking was more um, aggressive, dominant, precise. And when my breathing wasn't controlled, it was kind of sparse and it wasn't as precise. And fast forward to Muay Thai and then Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, that's where I started to realize uh, Jiu Jitsu specifically when I'm wrestling with someone and they're on top of me and I'm trying to get guard and trying to leverage them and create motions where I can come up and win. I started to realize that, you know, about 10, 15 minutes into it, you're out of breath, you're breathing heavily, Mm. like, like you're panting, like you would if you were running as fast as you could and sprinting. And so I thought to myself, this is the process of thought as a young kid, I'd always really try to break down the idea, the process problem solve. And I started to think to myself, well, what if I was to mimic outside of practice that breathing pattern, which was like gasping for air. And so I practiced it and on I, your own, like on my you, own, just doing it for five minutes just for fun. Like, like, I mouth. wonder what would happen. Yeah. Through oh, interesting. And just, okay. And so I was just, I was like, I'm going to, cause I realized if that's the breath I'm doing in that, 10 to 15 minute mark so they're in the last five minutes i just gas out and then the opponent's going to win if he's not as gassed as i am what if i practice that breathing so in that when that breathing does come i'll be more oh, capable okay and so i started practicing that and then it worked and i started uh, i was a white belt and i was you know tapping out uh, blue belts and brown belts and it was really cool and that was because of fatigue right their technique was way better than mine it wasn't because of some savant um, and how cool did you feel knowing that you had like the secret breath really, technique? Really good. Did like, you tell anybody? No, it just was <laughs> kind of your superpower. Yeah. Like it was I, like, I don't know part of my, you know, I've been running trainings for almost 12 years now. And to this day, like one of the big questions I have for myself, like people ask, how did you get into this? And I don't know how I came across it. Like, mm. I don't know why me, like, why do I know all of these, like specifically with breath work in the Pranayama tradition, there's roughly 200 different breathing patterns. Each breathing pattern has 25 variations. That means there's thousands of breathing patterns. How did I come across this? I don't know. Like there wasn't specific scriptures that I read that gave me the information. It was just something that started to come to me Mm. as the years went on. And of course there's older scriptures like the Upanishads and so forth, where I was able to decode various aspects of the breath through symbolic and poetic description in the Mm. scriptures. But just going back, I used that breathing and it worked. And then I was like, what if I nose breathe and started researching? I was like, oh, yoga. Oh, interesting. It was like, it was like, oh, so some, you weren't even into yoga at all. It was like something, but I was doing it though, the whole, my whole life. That's, the but you thing. just didn't know that's what it was. I didn't know the term. Oh, cool. You know, it was almost like it was like my birthright to do this. Like, this yeah. was my, like, your calling. My calling. And I'm so grateful and lucky I was able to intuitively find that purpose, you know, where sometimes we yeah. search our whole life to, like, what am I going to do with yeah. my life? From there, it just migrated to like nasal breathing. What if I did that through my nose? And then what if I alternated the the patterns of breath? What if I was to work my diaphragm in different ways into the chest, full chest breathing, belly breathing? What, What if I was to just play with this thing? And what if I was to intellectualize it and alternate the rhythms and processes of the breath? I was playing playing. to find what works. I was literally playing. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. And so that led me to feeling the experience of breath, Mm. which was physical performance enhancement. It was leading to bliss. Like you actually get high and it's not, (laughs) it's not a hyperventilation. high. It's, it's a high where you're, you're lucid. Mm -hmm. So you're like, you're very clear and lucid in the moment of feeling 
elated. And it's powerful. It is. And that's what I want to share with people, just a little taste. And I know we can't go into a full breathwork session on the podcast, but maybe if you could guide people through, just kind of give them a taste of what it's like to do a pattern of breathing. I would love that. Okay, great. Awesome. Um, so if you're if you're driving a car, you listen to this podcast and you're doing something, make sure that you have a safe space to sit down and relax. You're not going to be disturbed and angle maybe three, four minutes or what do you think? Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Okay, let's do it. All right. So just sitting here, finding a comfortable seat under your, pulled your car over, you're sitting on your couch, you're sitting on your floor or on a chair in your kitchen. Just make sure you're comfortable and relaxed. The more comfortable you are, the better. Just relaxing your posture. You don't need to be stacking your bones or any of that type of stuff. Just make sure you're comfortable. It's the most important thing. Keeping the eyes closed. And just try to keep your eyes closed the entire time. Try to bring your awareness to the inner experience. We're just going to be using a simple breathing pattern that you'll notice will begin to shift your perspective real quick. This is one of my favorite. So we're going to start off inhaling through the nose, inhaling through the mouth, exhaling through the nose. So it's one inhale split into two parts with a strong exhale. So in through the nose, in through the mouth, exhale through the nose. In through the nose, in through the mouth, exhale through the nose. Good. And keeping this up, just feeling into that process. In through the nose, in through the mouth, exhale through the nose. And so keep this up on your own. Just keep figuring out the mechanism of the breath. And once you feel like you've figured out the technicalities, the mechanics, start to feel the breath. You're going to feel a glow that arises from this process of breathing. important to bring awareness to a calming of the eyes there's a saying that if you can calm the eyes everything in the body will start to calm down when we close the eyes the eyes actually don't know what to do they're looking up and down left and right because they're so used to looking around at objects in the world and so just find a way to settle them down as you keep this breath In through the nose, in through the mouth, exhale through the nose. Good. And so just keep working one round at a time. One inhale split into two parts. Perfect. In through the nose, in through the mouth, exhaling through the nose. In through the nose, in through the mouth, exhale through the nose. We're going to be switching this up a little bit pretty quick here. I'm going to show you just how quick you can change your localized perceptual experience of your environment. This is a great breathing pattern to use if you are a little angry or you just got into an argument with your partner or you're feeling a little anxious or worried about things in your life. All you need to do is two minutes of this and then you're going to open your eyes right away. So just keep this up right now. We're almost there. Perfect. We're going to strengthen the exhales now, so keep doing everything you're doing the same, but just a little stronger on the exhale. Perfect. 
Perfect. All right, one more round. In through the nose, in through the mouth. Strong exhale out. Opening your eyes, let your breath become calm. Look at your environment. Notice how the whites are whiter, the greens are greener. Maybe a fog or a haze has overcome your eyes. You'll notice there's just a difference. Look around the rooms, kind of see the differences. See, observe kind of that, that haze that came over the eyes. All it takes is two minutes to find more depth. That was fantastic. And just a taste of what a full breathwork session is like, because breathwork sessions are like 60 minutes, yeah. 90 minutes. What a little more complex too. We'll use yeah. a multitude of breathing patterns, usually anywhere from four to seven different breathing patterns. Yeah. And sequenced. they also come with intensity too, because that one was fairly more of a relaxed. Yeah. And you start relaxed and then throughout the breathwork session, they become a little bit more intense, do they not? Yeah, build yeah. up just a bit. Yeah, and what I love about this process, thank you for sharing that angle. Mm -hmm. What I love about this process is you kind of dip between this lucid and lucid dreaming and sort of conscious state. You kind of drift between them. So it's a great practice and a really fun thing that, you know, some people, they want to have this experience of meditation or they want to have this deeper connection to themselves or life. Breathwork from my experience, and I'm, I'm assuming you would say as well, is a great way to bring people into that state of being where they're more connected, more grounded. And, you know, sometimes sitting in silence and meditation, I get lots of distracting thoughts. But if I do a little bit of breathing first and then sit and meditate, it's much easier. Why is that? The process of breathing is just so intimately entwined to physical movement and the operations of the body. Mm. You think about your breathing when you're sleeping, your breathing while you're listening, your breathing while you're driving. So everything we do is based on breathing. Mm. And so when we start to use the breathing in a voluntary way, because most of our breathing, the majority of it is involuntary. It's just the body is breathing for us. And when I say the body, the mind is telling the body what to do because there's operations of the mind that we haven't yet colonated and that can be kind of broken up into two parts. There's the involuntary portion of the of the mind and then the voluntary portion of the mind. The involuntary portion of the mind is controlling the involuntary portions of the body. And then the voluntary portion of the mind is like you exercising thoughts you want to think about and engaging actions of the body. So your mind says hand lift and the hand lifts. Mm -hmm. So the breathing is so intimately... Uh, tied to the physicality of our body and it is so intimately intertwined to the mind which is representing the spiritual essence because the mind you can't see it it's mm -hmm. different than the brain mm -hmm. and it's connecting us to consciousness and so when you engage the breath in a voluntary way where you start to control the breath like you just were what you're doing is you're starting to take the body off of its regular prescription autopilot kind of thing yeah yeah yeah, yeah. when it comes off autopilot it gets to have a whole new experience which is setting um alarms in the body of like something's happening something's, something's different shifting yeah and it brings clarity and i think the best way to really break it down is your mind is like the room you're in and then your thoughts are the things in the room so all the things you're seeing around the room right now if you're listening to this podcast your thoughts are the things in that room and your mind is the room. And so sometimes you can have so many things in your room that it feels like there's just no flow. I'm sure everybody's lived in a house or has a house or a room or a drawer in their kitchen where there's just too many things. And so what the breath does is it creates space some way, somehow, and I don't think it needs a definition or, or some precise scientific description but it is happening. It's creating space between the thoughts. And when there's space between those thoughts, you can then come in with more constructive, positive thinking because there's not, no one likes feeling claustrophobic. And that's what's happening when the thoughts are too close together. There's no 
place for movement and it's like you're in a small confined tiny little room and you there's no out Mm. the breath comes in creates a little space between that and then you can come back in with more oh you know what no i'm safe oh things are gonna work out you know what this challenge i'm in it's actually a ladder for my elevation i'm Mm. learning a lot right now this Mm. is interesting so it allows you to kind of switch the perspective And it's a beautiful tool because it's free to everyone, you know, like practicing a simple technique like breathing brings you back to, like you said, that space between the thoughts, between those uh, in that room, you know, you have, oh, I feel okay with this now. You know, sometimes in life you can get so overwhelmed. And like you said, it's like the kitchen drawer with too many things that don't have a place (laughs) and it creates stress and stuff. So that's what I I love. And thank you again for for bringing us through that little short little taste of breath work. Um, but I did want to also ask you, Engel, you have such a fascinating story and we've been friends now for, oh, what, a year now since the pandemic started? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so we've had many conversations and one of the most fascinating things I found out about you was you weren't always this man that you are today. You've, you've gone through a transformation and you've left an old life behind and you've moved into a new direction that required you to let go and to trust and to step out into the unknown You know, if somebody's listening to this and they're saying, I I feel like there's a change coming in my life. I want to change careers. I want to take a new direction, but I'm worried. I'm scared. What advice would you give them based upon how you have made that transformation in your life? That is possible that you can make a change and it will work out and to not make um, irrational decisions in the moment. I wrote something that I think can be relatable to people. And it was in relation to my journey and how I, um, how I found my way out of my difficulties. And so this message goes like this. We can often get into the habit of thinking like this. If I had his talent or her family or that house, things would be great. But it's important to get into the habit of not comparing your situation to anyone else's because you're not running a race. It may seem like others have more advantages, but God didn't make a mistake with you. Turn the media reports off. God has given you the grace you need to fulfill your destiny, and your destiny is unique to you. You were designed to be you, which at its foundation is wild and free, self-sufficient and competent, resilient and abundant. So you've got to shake off any self-pity, because it's more of a poison for you than anyone else. Even when justifiable, The resentment you harbor only serves to weaken your spirit. We've got to understand that our time and assignment is too important to go through life thinking about what we didn't get, who hurt us, and what didn't work out. It is a trick of the enemy. The enemy of fear and worry would love to rob you and to keep you discouraged in self-pity and blame. So let go of what's holding you back, because wherever you are, It's not forever. There were days when I didn't want to keep going. Parents divorced at five, both grandmothers dying of cancer, my grandpa dying of ALS, my mother battling alcoholism, dropping out of school at 13, living an illicit life from age nine to 21, spending some nights in jail, living in my car for almost three years, using shirts and sweaters as sheets, showering in rec centers because it's all I could afford. And as hard as it was, it was the school God gave me. I kept the faith. I outlasted the trial. I slowly turned everything around, and I found my dharma. I found my purpose. And no matter how tough it got, those days came and those days passed. So never forget, you can do this. And so that's kind of, I put my story into that little essay, you know. That's you fantastic. Can, you man. can make it. You really can. That's how it got to here, man. Mm-hmm. One step at a time. One step at a time yeah. and facing the challenge instead of running away from it. Mm-hmm. And I think so often in our lives when we're faced with those challenges, those difficult times, you, you say we try and wish them away, but it's learning how to work with them, appreciate and grow from them because that's building us into the person that we're destined to be, mm-hmm. you know? which is sometimes very hard to, uh, in the moment, right? I'm sure you had, like myself in my life, when you, when you hit challenges in your life, in the moment, you're like, I don't want this challenge. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I just want it to go away. 
but it's those things that shape us. And um, what would you say to somebody that's going through one of those challenges that they just want it to go away? How do they shift their perspective to embracing it and making the most of it? Yeah, no, that's a big challenge to figure out how to do that because sometimes these challenges can last three years living in your car, right? Um, the biggest thing is you've got to surround yourself with a new community. You've got to realize that the challenge you're in is one, it, this is your time. Like the light is on you. God is looking at you. The challenge has been given because God's like, okay, you've spent enough time here. It's time to get you on to the next show. Uh, I gave you everything you need in this moment and I love you so much. So it's time to move you on. Mm -hmm. And so you got to look at your challenge as this incredible, exciting opportunity to get more vulnerable, to get more open, to reveal more of yourself, to no longer have secrets because the secrets don't hurt anyone else other than you. The secrets can be used by the enemy against you. And the enemy is your worry, concern, and your fear. And so you need to understand that this is an important thing to release and let go of. And if you don't let go of your fear and your worry, it's going to pull you into a world of just self-deprecating thoughts. And it's going to keep you there longer because you're essentially resisting the progress forward. The tool to use is getting into community, finding some people to talk to and to be a part of something. Often when we're going through a challenge, we feel like we're not a part of anything. Like there's no purpose. There's no rhyme to reason. And another is to start to develop a personal practice of affirmation, like affirming you are capable, you are good enough. And start to connect to, like your faith was meant for the tough times. It's hard to be faithful in the challenging times. It's really easy to be faithful in the good times. Mm -hmm. And this is an opportunity to use all the tools you've been given and you have since birth, even if you didn't come from a faithful family, you still know about the words faith. You, you mentioned affirmations mm -hmm. for someone who's never used affirmations or is unfamiliar with the, how to practice that. What is an affirmation and how do you use that in your life? An affirmation is a process of taking self inventory and being honest with it. And so you can have negative affirmations or you can, which all of us do. And that's what brings us to the majority of our problems. The big, big shift is having positive affirmations. And those positive affirmations are going to really project us forward because it brings us into the shelter of gratitude. Mm. It brings us into the shelter of appreciation and acceptance. It brings us into this place where we can begin to take recollection of who we really are. You're alive. You were born. You're actually a miracle. Your parents came together. They made love. And they had a child. And you're here. Like, like the process is huge for you to actually be born. Mm -hmm. And that focusing on that and sort of affirming that in your mind is how you sort of cultivate that, the, the power of an affirmation. Yeah. Yeah. The other day I was given a gift. And I felt internally my head, well, first of all, I felt like my heart close and I, I caught myself again because I'm working on this within myself to expand to more appreciation and to more love and in my heart and to accept. And it was a really powerful moment for me of affirming that, that I am blessed and that this is love and generosity coming into my life and to affirm that and to appreciate it as opposed to thinking this is too good, this is too nice and pushing it away. I guess maybe in my childhood or there's some sort of programming, a negative affirmation that I only deserve so much or this is only so much that can come to me that is a good thing before something bad should happen. And so rewriting those programs through positive affirmations of affirming that my life is blessed, I am blessed, people love me, there is more love coming to me and working on opening my heart and appreciating more of everything around me, it changes everything. And it's also like an opening uh, to life for more life to flow through, right? So then you have to work on more because then life's going to say, okay, you can appreciate this. Here's some more to appreciate. Mm -hmm. If you appreciate what you have, all the abundance you already have, like you said, you were born, you're alive. You appreciate that. And it's like, and here's more. And here's more. It's like, it's fantastic. It's a great upward cycle, you know? It's fantastic.
But you said something though where it brings you into more life. Like it, it start and, and that's really what the affirmation does is it one, it's getting you comfortable and connected to yourself. As you start to begin to approach the process of appreciating yourself instead of thinking self concerning, self deprecating thoughts, it opens up more life. And when you respect yourself, when you respect who you are, when you appreciate who you are as you are through and through, it opens up for more life. And what comes through is this idea of God. And you start to realize, man, I don't like the word God. And it all stems from something in childhood, you know, like I've been turned away from this. I don't think it's right. Religion's gross. This is mm. that, this is that. But it opens you up and you're like, man, I think there's something magical up out there. Mm -hmm. I, I can't come up with an explanation for these coincidences and these miracles in my life. Like, why was that challenge so perfect that it brought me to this person that led me to that job that led me to my soulmate? How is that? How does that work? Yeah, man. You talked about this in, in uh, I think it was one of the pranayama, or the breathwork classes. You were talking about God. And I never had a, a negative association with the word God or the concept of God. I was like, oh, some people call it God. Some people call it divine, like, or the universe or whatever. I'm like, okay, whatever. We're all pointing towards the same thing. But... What I loved about what you just shared and what you shared before in the breathwork class was even more appreciation of this, this reality, this idea of synchronicities, of connecting and flowing. And then there's this beautiful divine plan that is waiting for you to open to it and, <laughs> and to appreciate it more than just like, yeah, I'm letting the universe run my life or yeah, God is, is good. It's like, no, feel that, mm -hmm. appreciate that, work with, play with that, you know, communicate with that relationship and then more synchronicities, more things flow in. I have that all the time now in my life where something, I'll be trying to do something and I'll get these like random things that won't work. And I'm like, why is this not working? And then I go, okay, I think there's something else I'm supposed to be doing. I gotta, you know, I'll, I'll be very careful. It's not like I'm being lazy, but it's like normally like this is odd and I've tried a few times and it's not working. And then I'm like, oh, that's why. I wasn't supposed to, because I was supposed to be here at this time. And it's like following that, what would you call it? Like scent or like that flow. Mm. And when things go smoothly, you're like, oh, here we go. I'm on this track and I meet this person. I meet my soulmate. I find this new job. I find this new opportunity. And it's a very delicate balance. I almost think of it as like surfing a wave where you have to be in tune. And then when you catch it, oh man, like it's magical. It is. It's magical. It is magical. And uh, so many people go through their life wondering like, like show me a sign i don't know if i believe in you god but i'm going to give you one more chance show me a sign and here's the thing is even when you were not a believer in something mysterious and magical beyond conception the signs were always there it's just sometimes the signs are really small i was talking to a, a friend recently and they're like everything's hard in my life. Business is slowing down. Everybody else in my profession is booming right now and no one's coming through the door and it's hard. And my daughter keeps being the one to boost me up, but it's hard and I just don't know why. And so we started talking. I said, do you have a newsletter? No, I don't. I said, do you have like a website or anything? No, I don't have a website. And I said, oh, so I gave them tips on how to create a newsletter, how to kind of create this place, this kind of ecosystem where they can draw the people who are already coming to their service and kind of keep them in that area and, and inform them about what's going on and what you've been up to and what are new services and new incentives and new opportunities you're offering them. And they were like, oh, that's interesting, really great. And so we went back and they're like, I just, I'm looking for a sign. I said, maybe this was the sign though. Maybe you've been saying this for the past couple months and we randomly come to this phone call and it's a free phone call. We don't know each other really well. And I just shared with you one tiny little thing on how to build like a quick newsletter, which is actually free. And you already have a whole bunch of emails. Now you can just start sending out a mass email to people who actually cherish you and your service and have spent money with you. And I said, you see how quick it is to not see the little miracles, the little things that are on our path when we're so focused on the negative what we don't have or what isn't working yeah and it's the enemy man it's the enemy of fear and worry it's so plaguing and so big that it 
it completely takes you over mm-hmm. to the point where you don't see anything. Mm-hmm. And I, I myself still struggle with it. You know, I'll find myself, oh, I don't, things aren't working or I'm just, there's a, it's like a, it feels like I'm dragging something behind the car, you know, like there's, there's dead weight and then I'll do a breath work session or I'll do some meditation or I'll go for a walk in the woods. And then I get that, like you said, that little bit of space, that little bit of distance. And I go, oh, I can let this fear go or I can let this go. And then I'm back to appreciation. I'm back to seeing things and appreciating them for what they are and right in front of me. And so often the worry and the stress and all those things that pull me down is from me thinking about all the things I don't have or the stresses in the future. And instead of just being like, what's right here right now? How can I appreciate this even more and expand this even more? And it always works out in a, in a beautiful way. Uh, I wanted to ask you, Engel, in your work working with people, doing breathwork teachings and yoga at your yoga studio there, teaching people yoga, and even just sort of one-on-one coaching with people too, what is the moment for you where you go, this is why I do what I do? You know what I'm saying? Like, what's that golden paycheck for you? Is doing this knowing sometimes I don't get paid, you know? Like, like three years living in my car knowing I'm not getting paid, living under a thousand dollars a month mm. and still doing it. Cause it's like the reason I'm in my car is because I'm doing this. The thing that makes me go home at night and say to myself, like, this is why I do this is one is I've found an avenue where my words can be heard because I love writing and I love sharing. Two is to come home and to realize that I was able to touch someone's life and to be somewhat of a miracle in their life in the form of a friend and to totally take away this weird thing that's been created over the years of teacher-student relationship. It's more of like friend and friend. You're going through a tough time right now. There is a way through. Why don't you try thinking like this, reading this, saying this, walking like this you know like you got to walk the good walk you got to talk the good talk think the good thoughts Mm -hmm. and so it's going home at night and knowing that i was able to touch someone's life like literally just touching someone's life man yeah that to me is is very similar in my in my field of work uh creating podcasts or acting or whatever it's like i get a, a letter from somebody saying hey you know i watched your show or i listened to this podcast episode and And I found healing or I found the courage to reach out to my father who I haven't spoken to in years and we patched things up. I mean, like I saved those letters and I'm like, this is why I do it. Mm. I touch somebody's life like you just said. And with my little thing, like my little contribution, being able to know that someone else's life was impacted in a deep way, because to me, that's the biggest gift I've ever been given is someone has seen me for who I am and given me a gift and, and helped me return back to my power, return back to my love of life or whatever, and and restore to me what I thought was lost forever. And that is like such a beautiful gift. And I can't think of anything else that I would want to give to somebody else. You know, it's like touch their life, return them to their power, get them reconnected to life. So I, I don't think we're meant to do anything else on this planet other than touch people's lives. Mm. I just don't. Because can you think of something more sacred, more divine, more beneficial than actually just touching one person's life and then kind of making a habit of going out there and complimenting strangers and acknowledging strangers and being someone who is doing random acts of kindness and service. I love that, man. such a beneficial thing, man, is like the best job is to help someone in life. But also, I I fully agree with the sentiment and the the feeling of touching someone's life. And I also know, too, that sometimes, because... I think to myself, yeah, I want to help this person. And then sometimes one of the hardest things is when they don't want to be helped yeah. or they're not ready to be. And you have to just let them go through what they're going through. Yeah. They have to do it themselves. There's that fine line of doing the actionable work for someone and then touching them with words. And I think one of the best things we can do when I say touch someone's life is speaking words of victory over them. What does that mean? That sounds amazing. What does that mean? Just <laughs> l- like the affirmations. Like, okay, you know, okay. Graham, you're doing great. Like things will work out. Ah. You know, where you are right now is not where you're destined to be. Your destiny is incredible. I found that the bigger the challenge, the greater the destiny, it's going to work out. Mm. You're going to be so surprised what's on the other side if you can just persevere through this. Mm. 
what do you call it? Speaking words of, how'd Speaking you say Speaking words of victory over people. Wow. I want a t-shirt that says that. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, Angle. Well, this has been a really fun conversation. I want to pivot a bit because we've had so many um, interesting conversations over the last year there. I really wanted to have fun with you on this podcast and talk about some things too that last time I didn't get a chance to talk with David Wolf. I had him on the podcast a few episodes ago and I only found out after he was on the podcast that he's uh, likes to play around with this idea of the flat earth. Mm. I remember we've had some conversations about flat earth and some fun conspiracy theories and such. So I wanted to bring that into this podcast because we, we often will share things and have fun exploring these ideas. So I wanted to ask you, what is your favorite conspiracy theory that you love to play with? Well, the time has come. <laughs> the time has come for this conversation. <laughs> yeah, for this conversation. Okay. Because so I know you like Sasquatch. We talked about Sasquatch a bit. I, I honest that that is, a, <laughs> I don't know if that's a, a conspiracy theory. I think it's real. You think it's real. Okay. There's just too many accounts of people who are, you know, trappers out in the forest and they're like three days away from any civilization. And they are having accounts of these weird sounds and rocks being thrown at them, right? Just, and, and I believe in what the indigenous say. And the indigenous have been talking about it for oh, hundreds really? and hundreds of years. Yeah, man. Oh, okay. I didn't know this. There's a great documentary. You can watch the guy from Survivor Man, um, mm-hmm. Les Stroud, I think. He did the documentary 10 part, I think. And it's free on YouTube. And you just type in uh, Survivor Man Bigfoot. Okay. Just type that in and you'll find all the episodes. It's really good though. It's like 45 minute episodes. And he goes in as someone who believes in possibility, but hasn't confirmed yet this is, if this is true or not. And just watching him through his journey, it's really cool. Just witness, he doesn't get, get anything on camera, obviously, but he it's all through British Columbia and through Alberta, some in like Missouri and other areas around the world. And it's just really cool to um, watch his journey. So that, I wouldn't say that's a conspiracy theory, just because... Okay. For me, it is because I'm like, I've never, I, I don't have any proof. So okay. to me, that's like a conspiracy theory. But There's interesting stuff too out there um, that mermaids are real too. Like there what? was like one video I watched uh, years ago on YouTube before YouTube became what it is now. Uh, and it was this fishing boat had caught a bunch of fish. And as they were pulling the big net out of water and it was just this massive bundle of fish something wild was ravishing through it and broke through the net and jumped out and you catch like this blur of it and it looks legit maybe it's not but there's also these um, stories i've heard over the years where in sharks they'll find stab wounds in it and sometimes they'll find these sharp points in the in its tail carved kind of spikes made out of bone or something stuck in um, sharks Oh. And so in this, I forget what this was, like a three-part documentary back in the old days of YouTube. And it was talking about how there was reports of these people who would listen to animals, like listen to dolphins in the water. And they would hear in pods of dolphins different sounds. And so they were hypothesizing that these mermaids, if they were real, they swam with the dolphins. Like they would swim in packs with the dolphins. And the dolphins avoid sharks, right? And so as did the mermaids. Yeah. And so it was really interesting. And then they like showed bodies, potential bodies that had washed up on the shore. So completely different. You have to imagine this is like a, a human sort of like animal that lives in the water full time. So it's skin, it's body, is it it's like eyes. the little mermaid where half is like human and half is fish. Or is it more like all one? Maybe all one or maybe there's two arms and then there's a fin at the back. Oh, yeah. But I, I wouldn't say that's my favorite. I would say my favorite. Th- 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 those are like little cool things yeah, yeah, to yeah. think about. Because you know what? They're magical. Oh, yeah. It's right? a fun. Yeah, like, it's fun like to play with. When you think of Bigfoot and you think of mermaids, like those, those those have magical settings in a child's life through story and Your son's cartoons. into this too, isn't he? Like, so yeah, yeah. yeah. He actually recently got me back into Bigfoot. Really? Last year. Oh, yeah. cool. But I would say the biggest and most significant conspiracy theory would be that we're living in a simulation. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Like a computer program kind of thing, right? Because it's been, it's not it, like Elon Musk has nothing to do with this. This is something that's been talked about since the beginning of time throughout all wisdom traditions, specifically in the yogic traditions, in the ancient Vedas dating back roughly eight to 10,000 years ago. And that's written tradition coming from oral tradition. They talk about we're living in this cyclical, repetitive history of samsara. And it means just repetitive, consistent, and cyclical, kind of like a computer-generated machine. That's what samsara means? Yeah. Okay. And so then you have this process of us living in this, it's morning, it's night, it's morning, it's night. 
The sun is sunny, dirt is dirty, water is wet. Everything is specific algorithms and they don't deviate. But the only thing that deviates in the algor- in this computer simulation is humans. Mm. And the more you look at it and you try to understand it, try to observe and experience like, is it possible? It's incredible. Mm. And you'll start to really blow your mind on it. And there's a lot of information you can go about in finding this i don't recommend going the science route i recommend going the spirituality route i recommend going the faith route to understand it because you can't use modern tools to measure it you have to use your conscience i think it was on the podcast i had uh, a friend of mine cindy busby on the show and i was telling her about those virtual reality goggles Mm -hmm. and i was saying that the first time i played with them when i took them off i was like how do I know this reality isn't just a really sophisticated version of these goggles that is my soul has stepped into, you know, like I'm putting my, these goggles over my human eyes. Maybe this human body is like a virtual reality set that goes over my, my aura or my spirit or whatever. And it feels real, just like the goggles feel real. And so that was the first time I started playing with this idea of the simulation that we're living in a simulation. But I agree with you hundred percent is that I would much rather approach this idea from a spiritual sense of how does this improve my life or how does this impact my life? I like the idea of it being a school or a a place for the soul to learn and to grow and to have experiences. That to me is much more of an enticing idea of the simulation. Um, And that's how I play with it. So, so is this something for you that you explore on a daily basis, this idea of the simulation? My whole life is dedicated to it. Yeah. (laughs) Literally everything I do is dedicated to it. Um, I mean, the whole purpose of spirituality and faith and religion is to humble us. In the Christian Bible, it says, deny your skin and embrace God. So like deny yourself, embrace God. So like think about that on the surface layer. You're like, no, I can't deny myself. I'll wither away. No, that's, oh, there's typical religion again, trying to get people to go down the wrong path. But what it's saying is like deny yourself. Stop doing everything for you. And do everything for God. And so what is God? Think of the behavior. If there was a God that was just the most beautiful parent, just a great parent. You know, think about your parents. If you had good parents and they cared about you, imagine a parent that was even better than that. Really cared about you. Cared about you so much, was going to design a world for you, was going to design a life for you, was going to give you a spirit, was going to give you abilities. It's pretty amazing. Mm. So the purpose of spirituality in its most fundamental form is to humble you and to bring you to a place of goodness and kindness and openness and non-rejection. And then if you can approach questions from that place, you're going to be really surprised where you go. Mm. And if you do, you'll start to realize like, okay, everything's based on the Big Bang. Well, how about this? What about our ocean? We don't know much about it. Either the close lake here, Cameron Lake, that there's parts of it where they don't even know where the bottom is. Same with Okanagan Lake. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's that monster or something that lives in the Okanagan. They, they say, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so now we can go multiple <laughs> routes here. But where I'm going with this is that the, the purpose is to humble you so you can approach questions and be super receptive. And when you're receptive, you can start to see coincidences. You can start to see possibilities. And if we have barely explored our ocean... How are we going to begin to even conceptualize or hypothesize what the universe is, let alone our galaxy, let alone the existence of this planet, let alone how this planet was formed, let alone how the solar system was formed. Mm -hmm. But if we can go to this place where we start to have this humbled experience, which brings us to introspection, which brings us to altered states of consciousness, which means we can be present in this moment, but forget we're in this moment and be so deeply in ourselves that we're having an experience that feels like there's no up, down, left, right, back, Mm -hmm. forth. And it's just everywhere, everywhere. Yeah. And it's vast. Mm -hmm. And in that place, you begin to acknowledge things beyond conception, things beyond what your subconscious is holding. You start to just like question yourself. You start to question what this reality is, what this existence is. And if the simulation is real, which I'm 99.9% sure it's real. Oh, wow. You know what? I think I'm ready to claim it. (laughs) I think it's a hundred percent real. I've been saying for the last 10 years, it's 99.9%, but I'm just literally going to right here today. I'm going to (laughs) say it's a hundred percent real according to me. Okay. And the reason for that is because 
it just makes sense. But if it if it is real, it changes everything about everything that we know about ourselves, about existence, about what life is. It flips the idea of what God was in our mind completely on its head and brings to something even more out of this world. Because it, it, it brings it to this place of, if this is a simulation, that means it's like an operating system, which means if we look at operating systems kind of in our world now, there is the CEO of a company, there's an owner, creator of the company, there's the person who founded the company. So there's the founder, there's the owner, there's the CEO. The CEO isn't the engineer making the hardware, our bio hardware. The CEO isn't making the software. So there's people doing that. So if this is a simulation, it's not even God that's created it. So God is even beyond what we're thinking then. So so it's bringing us to places beyond, 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 hmm. which I think is growing our, stretching our consciousness. And this is the whole point of yoga. Yoga is one, is to deepen our faith. So the beauty of yoga is that traditional yoga is has nothing to do with religion. It's saying... If you're Christian, it's going to help you become more Christian. If you're Muslim, it's going to help you become more Muslim. If you're Buddhist, it's going to help you become more of a Buddhist. It's going to enhance your faith and your connection to whatever it is that's ongoing in your life. And by doing that, we're stretching our consciousness. Mm -hmm. And what could stretch your consciousness more than trying to understand if this is a simulation or not? I love the idea. It's, it's, It's super fun to play with and be like, okay, so if this is built, if this is a simulation, or it's similar to this idea that I've heard other, uh, I think it was Joe Rogan who said this, of like, you are the hero of your own movie. Yeah. Uh, act as if you're the hero of your own movie. It's kind of like, and I always go, yeah, okay, how does this, does this improve my life? Or is it just a rabbit hole for my brain to go down and be like, yeah, I'm a nerd. And like, I think about all these things and I get lost in thought. It's like, hey, if this improves my life and we're living in a simulation and therefore, if I understand how to work with this and to learn from this and it improves my life, fantastic. Sure, I'll buy that. Uh, or the idea of like, you're the hero of your own movie. You know, this is a movie. And you're the hero. Like, what does the hero do next in the next chapter? How is he going to, or how is she going to stand up? Exactly. The yeah. hero. And the hero, you know, there's the micro and the macro to that. There's the hero of, say you're in a conversation and you're bored. The hero of that movie is finding a way through that boring conversation, persevering, not rejecting it. Because the hero is not the bad guy. The hero is always the good guy. So the hero doesn't say, Ah, uh, excuse me, conversation's over. I don't want to be here anymore. Everything about you is horrible. <laughs> it's realizing you're you're in a battle in that moment. A part of you wants to walk away and go do something you enjoy, but you're in a conversation you're not enjoying. The hero perseveres, makes it through. Coming back to the simulation, you have the founder, you have the owner, you have the CEO. Before someone f- like becomes a founder of some type of business, they've got an idea from someone. Someone seeded, something seeded their imagination to create something. So God is further than the founder. What? And then do you see how the you, how many people work on just the iPhone? Wait, wait, wait. So you're saying there's like an apple of the simulation kind of thing, like a company. Yeah. That like built the simulation and they were inspired by a higher being like God. Potentially many of those. And eventually you can trace it down to something. Eventually you can trace it down to the architect. Whoa, man. That's deep. The designer of the idea. Whoa. But do you yeah. see, there's nothing, like nothing will bring you deeper into an existential, I don't want to say crisis, but an existential <laughs> um, exploration epiphany, or exploration, exploration than contemplate. Like, like I said, though, as before I opened this, you have to pull yourself away from the whole conceptualized idea of what Elon Musk has said about the simulation you have to kind of get away from like the more modern mainstream idea of what the simulation is and you have to go beyond that Mm. but but he's given some good ideas about like the whole 40 years of uh, technical evolution from pong until virtual reality and how if we've done that 40 years what would we do in 10,000 years or even just a thousand years yeah you couldn't design a computer player in a video game that was real better than having a carbon-based being like us and then you, you know, this is just the interface, this lit, lit, the brain and everything about our physicality is the interface. And then the mind essentially is another word for consciousness, which is the hardwiring of this interface with the information to operate in the video game. So kind of the basis of yoga is traditional yoga is we're living in a simulation 
it's a video game. You are the player in the video game. And the goal is moksha. And moksha is freedom from the simulation. Hmm. So not freedom as in rejecting the simulation, but essentially coming to a place where you understand it. And you go and it's like from that moment, once you achieve moksha, you've been pulled out of this like Petri dish world video game and you're plucked and put into another one. So you're growing. Is it kind of like the matrix, the whole metaphor of the matrix where you wake up from the matrix, you see the, that there's a simulation, there's a, a, a matrix thing and then you wake up to it and then you can work with it. You know what? Kind of, but that's more of like a dystopian governmental overlord kind of experience where like oh, okay. reality is still reality based on human form. And then we've been put into a system by, you know, machines who enslaved us. Right. So say where we are right now, like they want to go with the development of AI and quantum computing. And then all of a sudden it becomes self-aware. We're at the singularity already. That's why everybody's receiving information so quick. That's like, think about 2020. We went through more radical sensationalized shifts than we ever have in the last 10 years. Right. It, it used to be like Y2K and then 2012, like there, there would be, there'd be years between it. And then in one year we're having like 15. Yeah. So yeah. there's, there's a process. And I think, um, this is my favorite conspiracy theory. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing with it, with us, uh, that I've, I've heard you talk about it before. So thank you for diving into it more because I hadn't heard it. Uh, you express it that way. So that's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, the last question that I always ask uh, my podcast guests is my magic painting question. So if you had a magic painting on your wall and it could be any color, colors you wanted, picture if you wanted to be a picture instead of just random colors, what would you choose for the, the painting and what emotion would you want to feel? Because you get to feel any emotion when you look at that painting to any degree that you want to feel it. What emotion would you choose and what would your painting look like? I know it right away. It's an old painting of a farm, and it looks like it is autumn, and all the leaves are like red. It's Canada. It's like red and greens and yellows, so um, the end of summer kind of thing. It's a big farm with like rolling hills, and I'm sitting underneath a tree, and I'm just really happy, and the colors and everything about this farm, everything removed from, you know, city life, and it's just like peaceful, and there's hay, and there's old cars and there's skills and there's abilities and there's jobs. There's, there's things to do on that land. There's, there's a purpose. There's, you know, it's, it's not for money. It's for purpose. It's for living. Like everything you do on that land is to live, not to survive. Mm. Awesome. Yeah. What's the emotion? The emotion is like happiness. Like, I feel like I'm at the right place at the right time and I'm on time. Okay, that's great. I love that feeling. Okay, so for someone who's never felt that before or isn't as familiar with it, that feeling as you are, how would you explain that to them in their body? How does it feel in your body? It's just like everything's okay. Everything is perfect just right now the way it is. And you're focusing on just the beauty and the presence of the moment you're not thinking about dinner and what you should make or if the bills need to be paid or if things are just going to work out or not it's just kind of you in this present moment and you're just content with it like it's just good if you've ever smoked weed it's like just feeling like you smoked weed and you're just chilling out on a summer day and watching just the beauty and the wind and you're like this is perfect if you're someone who believes in God and like you're just kind of like found that moment where you're just blissed out and God hit you it's like that moment mm. it's it's holistic it's sustainable it's lasting and it's replenishing great word great word dude thank you so much for sharing that that's fantastic you got to have a painting like that. You should put a painting up like that on your wall. I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it done. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much Angle for being on the show. Um, I know you guys have uh, Yoga Grace online, so if people I uh, want to check that out, um, I'll put those links below and you also have a retreat coming up. So you want to share with anybody about your retreat that's coming up? Yeah, we have a retreat coming up in uh, Tofino. That's going to be wonderful. It's kind of like the first in-person kind of thing we've done since COVID. And it's going to be great to have everybody there. We're almost sold out for that. So that's going great. 
but you can check us out there uh, on uh, yogagrace.ca. And if you're more interested in kind of more of these kind of things that I've been sharing about is pranayama sadhana. So pranayama, P-R-A-N-A-Y-A-M-A, sadhana. Sadhana means practice, S-A-D-H-A-N-A.com. And there is kind of where I share kind of the stuff we've been talking about here today. Awesome. Well, I will put those uh, links in the show notes or below the YouTube video so people can check out those links and, and see more of your work. Cool, man. Angle, thank you so much. Is there anything else you wanted to share that we missed? Thank you so much for having me here, um, being a part of this uh, show with you and just being able to share and be in this moment. And um, for whoever's listening to this, you're going to make it through. Things are going to work out. And just just believe in yourself. It really does a huge service for you and your family or in your community. And just know like things wouldn't be the same if you weren't here. And it's going to work out. Just got to believe in yourself. Awesome. Thanks, Engel. Yeah, thanks, man. Well, that's it, everybody. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. Thank you for your patience with me getting this episode out. The last one, I was in the middle of a move, so it's been a bit of time elapsed until this one came out, but thank you for your patience. I love you guys so much. A huge thank you to Engel for sharing his insights and his passions on this episode. I really enjoyed it. A huge thank you to Eskimotion for his use of the song In Dreams in the beginning of my podcast. Always sets the tone. You're awesome, Eskimotion. Thank you so much. And also, I want to say a thank you to Victorian Joy. He is the gentleman who played the flute music during Engel's short little breathwork taste tester, (laughs) the little demo that he gave us. So I reached out to Victorian and he said, yeah, man, here's some music that you can put behind the the breathwork uh, demo or, or a taste And uh, so I was like, oh, this is awesome. This works great. So I had fun making that. If you want to check out more of Victorian's music, you can check out his link in the show notes below. He has a Patreon where he will send you music every week, his own flute music. And it's so peaceful and relaxing. It's great to meditate to or just go through a walk through the woods. Enjoy. I love it. So click on those links below. If you're interested in trying out a breathwork class with Engel, he does a free one every month. So you can go to his website, check that out. And uh, sign up, try a full class, have some fun with that. And uh, now I want to expand my heart and and just share my deepest appreciation for all of those who have sent donations to support this show and help me along on this journey and continue the growth of this show. I, I, I'm so grateful. And when I started this, I didn't really know if it was going to be sustainable, if I, how long it would last. And it's, it's still going and I'm, I'm working on the whole creating my own schedule, creating my own routine. You know, I've been working on set for so many years where somebody says, hey, this is when you show up tomorrow, 5 a.m., wake up, let's go. <laughs> and so now it's like, okay, you're, you're, you got it all on your own plate and you're scheduling, you're prioritizing and you're doing your own thing. So I'm learning about setting my own schedule, trying to keep uh, consistency in the routines and such. And you guys have been so supportive of me as I've made this transition and taken this new path in my life. And I just want to thank each and every one of you who has donated to the show, who has shared this podcast, who has created fan pages and, you know, extra content and stuff about the different guests I have on. You guys are fantastic. And I'm so grateful every time I see that stuff. So thank you so, so much. It means the world to me and has taught me a great lesson about blessings in this life and appreciation. And that's what I mentioned in this podcast uh, with Engel there, where I was talking about appreciation expanding. And then the more you appreciate, the more life brings you to appreciate. And that was what happened to me. Some people sent me some, some financial support and I just, I was overwhelmed. And I was like, you know what? Like, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful. And, and, And beyond the financial support, just in my life and that appreciation boils over into everything. And then there are always more things to appreciate. So I love that upward cycle that appreciation can bring. So I just want to thank you all so much for your support. It really means the world to me. And uh, there is a live chat going on with Angle and I right after this episode. So you're listening to it now. You're like, what are you talking about a live chat? Well, you can chat with Angle and I on Telegram. If you don't know what Telegram is, it's just like a chat app like WhatsApp or what's it called? WhatsApp, uh, Facebook Messenger. It's kind of like one of those things. But... I think it's kind of better because you can do live chats like Clubhouse. If you ever heard of Clubhouse? Anyways, long story short, go to the link below. There's a link to my Telegram page. 
Angle and I are going to be chatting live. And if you got a question, you're like, hey, I want to ask Angle a question live, you can do that. So we're going to do these Telegram chats after the podcast episode with the guests that can do it and just hang out and ask questions. It's kind of like, um, you know, after a movie premiere, people get up on stage and then people can ask questions about the movie and such. <laughs> so this is my idea. Well, actually, this isn't my idea. I think Angle was the one who suggested this. And I thought, that's a great idea. I want to do that for the, uh, for the podcast. So we're going to try it out. It starts right after the show, so you can click the link in below, download the app, uh, or if, even if you're on a desktop computer, they have a desktop app too, or put it on your phone, join the Telegram group that I'm in, you can join the chat, you can raise your hand to ask a question, and we can hang out and have some fun. So we're going to be doing that right after this episode, and all the other, you know, all the links are below, you know what I'm saying, they're always below, check them out, have some fun with it, and to finish off this podcast, I want to just send out some prayers. I want to send out some love and I want to send out some appreciation and specifically a prayer for a vision of the future that we can all tune into. And something that has been on my mind and in my heart for a while, and I've shared this with you guys uh, previously, is the active role and the active participation that we need to be making in our future. So things are changing, and we're going through what I believe is a purification process. I read a book uh, years ago that said, mountains are for finding vision and valleys are for purification. And that was this line that just really jumped out at me in this book. And I really took it to heart, and I went, you know what? This is a time on earth when so many things are in upheaval, so many things are changing, and there's a purification process going on, I believe. And during those processes of purification, things are shed and the important things are retained. And so what I wanted to share with you all is the importance of protecting those values, those traditions, those sacred elements of our lives, of our families, of our society, and then allowing the things that are compromised are problematic, (laughs) There is fraud or there is um, troubled issues, organizations, whatever. They will need to crumble. They will need to fall away. And new things that are more sustainable need to be built. And this isn't about rewriting history. This isn't about destroying our our past. Although there are people that want to do that, there needs to be a, a middle ground where we need to let certain things fall away because they are no longer sustainable. But we also have to protect what is true. We also have to protect what is valuable, and that's what we all need to decide. What are we going to stand up for? What is going to stand the test of this purification process? So my prayer that I want to share with you all is to hold a vision that we are able to maintain these values. We are able to maintain these intrinsic things that are so important to us and that we stand up for them, that we have the courage to do that. And we hold this vision in our minds and in our hearts, and we feel it as if it's already happened. This is a technique of prayer that I wasn't really aware of until recently, and I read a book about the power of prayer. And it was fascinating because the insights of prayer transcend religions, and this book was covering the commonalities of prayer between them all. And what came that I got from this book that was mentioned was the the similarity in feeling it as if it had already happened. You were giving thanks as if God or the divine or a higher power had already brought this blessing to you and you live from that place. And I thought, this is beautiful. I like this a lot. So I wanted to share that with you guys because that's what I'm doing. And I want to invite you to do the same as to hold a vision of a positive future, of one where you are standing up for the values that you deem important and you seeing that future come to fruition, come to pass, and you're living in that future, what does that feel like in your body? What does it feel like in your heart? Take that time and just tune into those feelings. Give thanks as if it had already happened. Yes, there's going to be challenges. Yes, there's going to be things that don't align with that. And we have to juggle those. We have to maneuver through those. But yet we can still in our hearts live from a place of faith and of courage and of vision. And that's what I want to leave you guys with. I love you all so much. Thank you for supporting the show. Thank you for supporting my journey. This is a lot of fun for me, and I love having you guys along for the ride. Cheers.